Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, four nerds by nerds, hanging out with Nerdarchist Ted. And today we're gonna get totally annihilated with the Tomb of Annihilation. Jump down to the description below where you can sign up for Nerdarchy the newsletter, get weekly gaming tips, as well as learn how to game with Nerdarchy. You'll also find a link to Amazon where you can purchase the Tomb of Annihilation if you so desire. All right, so clearly if we've got the Tomb of Annihilation in our hands, I guess we're going to talk Tomb of Annihilation. I, I guess. So either that or we're going to beat each other into Annihilation with them. We're both armed. Uh, well, I've got arms, that's for sure. But I, I really would not be interested in trying to either resist being beaten or beat you into, into submission. So it, it took a little work uh, for us to find our local flags that actually had Tomb of Annihilation. Indeed. Like, there was one that's really close to your house, but I think they had carried, like, one copy or something. <laughs> and, of course, it was sold out before either of us got there. Yeah. So then it became a hunt of, you know, who do we call, where do we try to go, and... But we did find one at the comic book store in Glassboro. Absolutely. So, kudos, they actually had a nice little stack of them, and along with some of the other stuff, uh, which you may actually see in another video. <laughs> but anyway, so I started looking at it. One of the things is, you know, the... Um, the art on this book is pretty freaking amazing. I've seen this thing where people... You're supposed to, you're supposed to do it like this way. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> like this, you got to hold it up. Yeah. No, no, you got to hold it where it's covering half your face. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, I did go. it wrong. Okay. There we go. That's what we're supposed to do? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to, it? Supposed right. to like, shout or yell or scream. So that, yeah. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're pictures. They're, I don't know, they may not be really screaming. Well, you're supposed they, to open your mouth like you're... Yeah, they may not appreciate if we scream. <laughs> Well, anyway, the cover on this is great. It looks good. Nice glossy finish. The same, you know, half matte on the back. So far, so good. We have we have it retails for forty nine ninety five, and if you get it on Amazon, it'll be significantly less. Right. Yeah. Now, I did see some uh, some people pointing out on Facebook that the guy on the DMG is actually Aserac. Uh, yes. So thought that was you know some cool foreshadowing that was done. Yeah, three years into the mix. <laughs> well, you know, you got to plan these things out. You know, one of the first things you get when you open up the Tomb of Annihilation is that awesome green devil face, which is amazing. Which, you know, if you're familiar with Tomb of Horrors, you're familiar with that. Uh, when you open up to the very first interior page um, where it talks about, it's got it's information on the cover. It's got the foreword from Chris Perkins. And, you know, it, it also goes in. They actually brought in a story consultant for this one. It is the writer from Adventure Time, and that is Pendleton Ward. Nice. So they, they wanted to capture some of the humor from that show and, and insert it in, into here. And I guess they bounced some ideas off of them. That's pretty awesome. So Yeah, that is pretty cool that they're kind of going like, you know, a little bit outside of the norm for, for talent is to bring in on these projects. And, you know, having that well-known name you know, is cer certainly going to do the project some, some extra ju justice or some, some extra... Uh, you know, spread. If you yeah, will. and the forward written by Chris Perkins really kind of goes into like why they why they got uh, Pendleton the right and and the ideas behind that. So that's kind of cool. And on the cover, you know, we have Ben Oliver is is the cover artist does a great job. Uh, deep within the jungles lies a tomb from which no adventurer returns. So uh, Ben Ol Oliver reveals the tomb's sinister, sinister architect who is trapping souls for reasons unknown. Enter at your own peril. Well, actually, you, you kind of learn a little bit as you read through as to what, what it is that he's doing with them, but you know. Well, the DM learns, but <laughs> the players shouldn't be. That's true. So here's, here's the thing, guys. We're going to try and keep this kind of relatively spoiler-free. Uh, there might be some things that slip in, for the, but for the most part, we're not going to be doing spoilers. That's true. So there's the disclaimer, as there always is. And it's one of these little, you know, itty-bitty little things that they add in in there just to add some extra humor. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. And it is itty bitty, and that's why Ted's reading it, not me. <laughs> so, this adventure will make your players hate you. The kind of simmering hatred that eats away at their souls until all that remains are dark little spheres of annihilation where the heart used to be. P.S. Don't forget to tear up their character sheets. <laughs> Very important. Uh, so, and then, like, as we move into the book, uh, one of the first things you come across is Dramatis Persona. Right, and what that is is basically, it is a short description of the NPCs that all appear, as well as how to pronounce their name. So I thought that was a cool little ad because you know what, D and D nerds are always fighting over how to pronounce <laughs> shit that's been made up all the time anyway. So they're like, no, look, here it is. 
So that that's incredibly helpful for for those that actually care about that kind of stuff. So I, I enjoyed going through some of that stuff, even if some of them were um, pretty obvious to me. It was good to see, like, oh well, matches up with my line of thinking. I'm I'm glad about this one. A couple that I might have questioned. It's like, oh well, here it is. Then then you know, as we delve a little deeper. We get into the basically the reason why everyone is on this adventure and on this quest, and that is the death curse. Now we won't go into the details of the death curse because I'm not sure I haven't read the whole thing, so I don't know when the players find out of it. But I do know like there's a problem. They've been sent to solve it. It basically is the death curse, right? And you pretty much know that right away, even if you don't know the name of it. But there is some vicious stuff in there, and it also might have some cool things if you just wanted to introduce that by itself into your campaign. And that, that in and of itself is a, is a worthwhile addition to this. Uh, one of the next things that comes up is character hooks for selected backgrounds. Well, even before you get to that, though, I think um, it, it might be worth mentioning the meat grinder mode. Oh, well. <laughs> and in this one, we can actually just tell you what it is, because if you're playing this, I'm pretty sure your DM's going to let you know. If he, if he doesn't, he's kind of a jerk, to be so, honest with you. The, the, the real crux of this is, like, okay, you've, been, you've dropped. It's time for death rolls, death saving throws, if you will. And instead of having the 10 to pass, it's a 15. That, that's, what they, that's what they say by clicking on the meat grinder switch. Yeah, it make, it's definitely going to make it a little bit tougher. And, and uh, so the next thing we have... Character backgrounds for selected ba uh, character hooks for selected backgrounds. I thought it was pretty awesome that it gives you all of the officially publicized backgrounds from the player's handbook, Skag, and within this book itself, and how to hook those characters right into the story. So the fact that fifth edition requires you to pick a background, you could literally just lay in the, oh, blah, 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 blah. It says so right here. You've got a hook right into the story for everybody. End of story. Now, I might be mistaken, but I don't remember seeing this in any of the previous adventures, pre-written stuff. Now, we haven't played them through, so I, I could have possibly missed it, but I don't think so. I'm certain these guys out there, as awesome as they are, will, will correct us one way or the other uh, or inform us that, inform us that we're right. I think I think this is something that should be done for for all all adventures. So uh, the the ne yeah that it is a great idea. The next section you get into is races and Cholt. and there's only two things that I really want to point out. One is the awesome Aracroca art, right? Which we'll get some art you know, throughout this video for you guys to take a look at. But where instead of looking like eagles, they look more like really fierce parrots. Yes. There's some, you know, a cross between a parrot and an eagle. Uh, I, I look at it as it is still a bird of prey, but it's colorful. So I like I like that. I, I think, you know, in earlier editions, the Aracocra being vulture-like, I was never, never impressed or interested in them. What they've done with the 5th edition Aracocra in all iterations, I've really enjoyed me and Ted differ there. I like the dirty, grungy uh, Eric Croker of old, personally. <laughs> but each to their own. So now that brings us to the next thing in the race section I think is worth mentioning. And it is, is the Batiri Goblins. Uh, they, they are quite cool. And in case you felt like doing something a little bit ridiculous, they have a thing called the Battle Stack. <laughs> Which I think, reading this you know, lengthy, lengthy you know, section... Well, lengthy for what it is. Right, right. let's just sum it up. <laughs> so, up to nine goblins can stand up on each other's shoulders to form a battle stack. The topmost goblin makes, makes your attack rolls and makes any mental saving throw. The bottommost goblin has the ability to move and makes all physical saving throws. But the thing is a battle stack, even though there could be up to nine of them, only gets one attack, but with advantage because it's the built-in pack tactics. It's literally not. It's literally worse than if they were to all just attacked you at the same time. But it's hilarious, so I kind of like it. So they they have the ability to like if if they get attacked, only one of them can can die unless you do some kind of area effect thing, and they have to make a saving throw to stay together. Right, and if they fall, they just end up in a giant pile of goblins. 
in one square. <laughs> and they have to use their action to climb back on top of each other. Should, right. should they decide to recreate the battle stack. And why would you not recreate the battle stack? You, you appear much more fearsome and a, a, like a larger opponent. And they also do this other thing, right? These goblins all create these cool war masks, mm -hmm. and they carve them to look fierce, and they also kind of like serve as a coat of arms for them. So I found that part a lot of fun, too. I, I, I did as well, and I'm actually really impressed with the artwork on those battle masks. And, you know, there's only four of them are on this page. If you had to pick one, which one do you like the most? Oh, man, it is really hard. Uh, there's two, like, incarnations of they look like kind of like boars, and both of them are freaking amazing. But the one that looks like a minotaur head looks really cool, too. Uh, the one that looks like, actually looks like a frog smashed to, in together with a goblin is actually my least favorite, but they okay. all look cool. See, I would say the one at the bottom was my was my least favorite. The one at the, one at the top that looks like a demonic treant, that, that's the one that I would go for. The, yeah, it, it's really cool. Like I said, the art and uh, the art in here is really great. Uh, there's not quite enough to warrant a flip through, but we were tempted. So now you get to like now you get to the section where things to do, right? Uh, so you have uh, there's special items you can buy, you know, like a canoe, which is you know essentially the same thing as a rowboat. But if you want the canoe instead of a rowboat, there's your options. If you're looking for stuff to buy. Let's face it, you're in the jungle. Bugs are going to be a problem. You probably want some insect repellent. Well, you know, we, we can have that happen. <laughs> That's true. Um, and also, one of the problems with being in Chol is most of the water isn't really drinkable unless you boil it first or something. So that's why you're going to want a rain catcher in order to capture rainwater. So, it's very, very good. You can get, a, you know, per inch of rainfall, two gallons of water. And they, not, also not have, they also have their own, like, special alcoholic beverage. Then there's a weapon, which is a simple weapon, but it kind of is like a long sword you can throw. Yeah, it's got a close close range, does a D8, and it's a simple weapon. I think there there could be some up in arms about about that. It doesn't have the versatile property though. That's true. So okay. there's that. Uh, and then we get to another fun section, <laughs> and this is betting on dinosaur races and actually racing dinosaurs. Like one of the things happens if you fail your check by a certain amount, your dinosaur goes berserk. And can't complete the race. <laughs> so it, it's a it's a very in depth section with a pricing guide or betting guides, um, and then it's got all the different speeds and difficulty checks or difficulty classes for the different dinosaurs that you want to use. There's a two legged version, a quadruped version, and then there's the no holds barred where everything is allowable. So. Yeah, I want to say it's an even. It's even more fun. It's more than that, though. It's a fun section, <laughs> you know. So, so that that's awesome. Of course, you know, you also have you know a, a whole uh, random chart for rumors and Cholt for your gather gather information checks, which is kind of cool. You also get into the expedition begins now, and that is basically a bunch of survival rules for you know for surviving in the jungle, for going through things, dehydration, navigation, all like the regular stuff you would kind of deal with. But they kind of detail the rules. You know, all throughout this book, it is packed full of awesome maps. Like, it's almost like, it's almost worth getting to steal all the maps from. But you get also a bunch of other cool things. There is a handful of new diseases. You don't want to get stuck with throat leeches. <laughs> Just saying, it's going to suck. Yeah, that does not sound appetizing at all. Uh, and also, there is a little sidebar. Like, we almost missed it. It, it this sidebar is probably one of the coolest things in the book, and it is very easy to miss if if you're not reading everything pretty thoroughly. And because you know, again, we're not going to get into the details of what it is, but the death curse, the toll is is pretty harsh. So if your character dies and you don't want to deal with the death curse as is, there is an al an alternate option. Although it's pretty savage. And it actually may be, like, your only option if you want to play that character. Uh, so, do we get into a little bit of detail with it? How do you want to do this? So, I, you know, I think we're going to tell this one. This might be a spoiler. Just wait ten seconds and go ahead. <laughs> but, uh, so basically, Cure for the Dead, you bring your character to, like, a witch doctor, and they make you a zombie. But you have the personality of yourself, and there's rules for being an undead. So, so that's pretty cool. But you get to be a freaking zombie. You do get to be a zombie. So we have rules. 
It's in here. It's in there. So that's pretty cool. Um, what I, I scoped out another thing that would have been really easy to miss, and that is an arrow croaker ritual. It takes eight arrow croaker to do it. And but at the end of it for three days, up to ten people can gain a fly magical fly speed. So that, that's kind of cool. It's an interesting thing that you can introduce into the game. Uh, there's also a chart in well, here. Well, you know, it's not, it's not only something you can put in, in in your game for Tomb of Annihilation, but if you happen to have Arrow Coker in your world, there's nothing to say that you couldn't put that in as your, in, in your game, in your homebrew. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's what I mean. It's something to cherry pick and steal from here. Which, you know, that that's what we'll probably do is we're probably going to, like, cherry pick and steal a lot of stuff. This book is packed full of tables as far as random encounters, things like that. There's even slave labor's uh, table, which basically tells you what the slaves are doing. Or if maybe you are a slave, what you're, you would be doing. And then, then there's actually, like, interesting things that could happen because that's what your slave job was. So from there, now we're going to pretty much skip everything and go right to the back of the book. So if you if you get this and you go to page 191... You're going to be able to get access to, as I said in the beginning, two new backgrounds that they introduce here. That's the anthropologist and the archaeologist. Reading through both of them, like my knowledge cleric in Dave's game, I instantly read both of them. Were like he would love both of those as opposed to just the boring acolyte that you know he wound up being. Uh, it, or sorry, not acolyte, uh, sage. Like these things seem a little bit more in line with what he was doing, but it would totally change the character because as if opposed, he changed it, yeah. yeah, it's like, as opposed to the guy that sits in the library and eats and reads, he would be more adventurous. I might have, you know, changed where the stat placement was. You know, I might have done something very different. Um, but they are completely cool and very different from the other backgrounds that, that we had had access to previously. Right, the anthropologists, you just study other other cultures, other civilizations, really cool, and then you like kind of pick one, and that's like, that's your thing. Yeah, um, the, the abilities are kind of cool, uh, featured a depth linguist, you can communicate with humanoids who don't speak any language you know, you must observe the humanoids interacting with one another for at least one day, after which you learn a handful of important words, expressions, and gestures, Enough to communicate on a rudimentary level. So you don't really get the language, but you can be like, I'm hungry, <laughs> where's the bathroom, that kind of stuff. Uh, like, So that's that's pretty close to being one of the more powerful of Abilities. the features. Yeah. So when you get into the archaeologist, their feature is historical knowledge. When you enter a ruin or a dungeon, you can correctly ascertain its original purpose and determine its builders, whether those were dwarves, elves, humans, yontai, or some other known race. In addition, you can determine the monetary value of art objects more than a century old. So, like, I think that one is equally, if not more, powerful to a standard adventurer. It uh, is. So it's like, oh, well, yes, that's clearly worth 200 gold. I don't need to worry about taking this to somebody. Uh, now, your DM might fight you on this when it's like, oh, well, you've never heard of this culture, so you clearly have no idea who could have made this. You know, you might think it was something. So I see this one, this particular one, as possibly starting some arguments at the table. It's a good possibility. Uh, then from there, it kind of goes into all the random encounter stuff again. This is actually another great spot for you to just kind of cherry pick things uh, to throw in, to throw into your game. Yeah. So you've got caches, treasure drops. You know the actual you know different encounters that you're going to fight. Dead explorers. Pretty pretty awesome, if you ask me. Yeah, that, that part is actually really cool. The fact that you know that's on a random table, and it, like, and if you're making your own random tables, like that's things to keep in mind. Like not just monsters to fight, but interesting things that can come up. Right. So also we have in Appendix C we have discoveries. Well, this is where you're actually going to get like interesting. I want to say mundane, but they're not really. But they're not magic either. So. We, we're going to get, let's see, you've got flora and fauna, which is dancing monkey fruit, manga leaves, zubu, yacha, waka nut, wild root, cinder berries, ryath root. And, and they're all going to have like different kinds of uh, properties that you can add right into your game. This is something that I was, you know, trying to consider for our homebrew as to like, okay, well, we don't need to just have, you know, apples and strawberries and watermelons. We should have something that's 
culturally unique or whatever for our world. Right. So, like, looking at... I'm just going to look at one of them right now, and that's the Riath Root. Any creature that ingests a Riath Root gains two die four temporary hit points. Sweet. I'm going to eat these all the time. A creature that consumes more than one Riath Root within 24-hour period must succeed a DC 13 Constitution saving throw or suffer the poison condition for one hour. Uh, maybe once in a while. Oh, man. Imagine a... Uh... Grung and immune to the poison condition. Yeah, those guys could eat this stuff all the time. Well, that's pretty, uh, pretty hot stuff if you ask me. So we get into a whole whole new section of magic items, and they're very thematic to Chill and the Tome of Annihilation. And some of these things are oh, these are legendary and artifact things. They're held by specific NPCs. But then when you go to those NPCs, they are nowhere near the challenge rating to be able to hold those things, if you ask me. <laughs> it's like, oh, here's an artifact. It's held by a dude who's a challenge seven. Whoa. <laughs> okay, then. Which begs the differ is that mean that the challenge rating isn't really accurate for him having that artifact. But, and like you said, then there's like thematic things like the Mask of Beast, which is basically one of these cool carved masks that lets you cast, you cast Animal Friendship. Or there's like one of these legendary items you're talking about, which is like a dagger named the Bookmark, which is odd, odd name for a dagger, but it's still some cool magic items you can add into your game. I actually like the Ghost Lantern, first and foremost, because it does an auto-stabilization. Oh, nice. Uh, so I thought that one was pretty pretty snazzy, and you know, knowing what I know about you know how the, how the, the game goes or how the, the encounters can go, having something that auto-stabilizes you, not too bad. Just stay away from someone that, you know, is going to cast a spell good or evil, because then it just becomes a lantern. Don't! <laughs> I hate when that happens. I hate when they cast a spell evil, good or evil on my lantern. So then, of course, you know, we have the Staff of the Forgotten One. So if you're going to play this game, don't read this, because it's literally held by the bad guy. Knowing what he can do... A bad guy. Uh, a bad guy, <laughs> sorry. Because <laughs> uh, there's lots of bad guys in this one. Uh, so, yeah, he's got it. It's a bad thing. So the monsters and NPC section starts right off with Azarak. Azarak, if you want to go by the pronunciation guide. Probably a good <laughs> idea. Challenge rating 23. Now that's a lich plus some. Indeed. Uh, so we get into albino dwarves, which we don't have any actual race information on No, anything. these are just strictly monsters. Well, I, I was I was just saying like straight up through the book. Yeah. We don't get we don't get new races. We talked in the earlier video about possibly getting grung stats. They're not in here. Um, so we have to look to Xanther's guide. So, you know, who knows, maybe albino dwarf will be a new sub race for us. But we have Aldani, which are cool oh. lobster people. But also, you know, the albino dwarves are kind of cool cuz they get some spell casting. Yeah, that is, that is something that I thought was pretty interesting. You're not used to, to seeing that. But we'll see, if they become a player race, we'll see how that works out. So one of the cool things that I do think is interesting in the Monster Manual, there is a handful of small beasts that are not like, oh, this is something that exists in the real world. Mm -hmm. They're cl clearly magical creatures in the D&D-verse. But it's like, oh, with your DM's permission, you could add, you know, you could, you could get this through a... Uh, you know, a find familiar spell. And one of those things is the Il Mirage, which is essentially a unicorn bunny. Yeah, I mean, the fact they've included a lot of uh, a lot of beasts in here is cool. And, you know, they've made them beasts. They, they could be magic, you know, magic thing or monstrosities, I guess, maybe. But they're not. They're just kind of animals. They're cute and fun. Like, like the unibunny <laughs> that you mentioned. Also, you know, there's the Aldani, right? Which are probably delicious with a nice butter. They're the humanoids, butter. man. Oh. oh, they are monstrosities. They the, used they used to be humans. They got cursed, and now they're lobster. Folk. Now they're lobster folk. Yeah, so there's a lot of cool stuff like that in here. NPCs. You're gonna see crossover uh, from previous editions with things like the assassin uh, vine. So here, this is this is one of the things that um, I actually wish that they would have taken all the NPCs and put them together. Taken all of the the things that could be grouped together, like dinosaurs, like that. That's how it was done in the regular monster manual. So that's that's my only issue with the layout. Is I, I would have liked the things to be linked as opposed to like oh well compartmentalized. Yeah. 
Like, yeah, yeah, monsters in one appendix, NPCs in another appendix. And then if you have monsters of the same type, like there's a bunch of new dinosaurs, why not put them all together? So that, that, that's my complaint on the layout. Um, you got a, a, a titan called a Atropol. Uh, th this thing is utterly terrifying to look at. I, I don't know what it's supposed to be. I, I just, you know. Uh, well, one, it, it, it has the titan subtype, but it's also undead. And it's huge. And this thing looks pretty nasty. It's a, it's a challenge rating 13. So this is going to be an interesting thing to cherry pick, pick for a game. We got a Bodak, but we had that in Volo's Guide. That's the other thing. There is a lot of crossover between Volo's Guide, the monsters, and the monsters in here. So, But, like, everyone, or I would, I would assume, Watts says you're probably going to have the monster manual because you, you need it. There's a, hand, there's a lot of encounters that are in this book that that use monsters outside of here so you need the monster manual but you don't necessarily need to have volo's guide so anytime that you've got something from volo's in here as an encounter they put that monster in yeah and it, it just makes sense so we we get a brontosaurus and you know what this is nice because this is getting this, this fills that nice role of i'm a i'm a circle of the moon druid but there's aren't there aren't certain uh beasts that i can turn into that are like of the right challenge rating. Right. So a challenge rating five is perfect for Brontosaurus, uh, and, and, and it's going to add a place for I think you know for the those wild shaping druids that gets you up to gargantuan. Yeah, it's and so. it's really big. <laughs> we have another tiny el elemental Chewanga or Chewinga, which is cool because when you're summoning elementals or con I should say conjuring elementals, you're going to have more options. Again, more dinosaurs. You got the Dinonychus, you got the Metrodon, although if you talk to anybody who's, you know, into any of that, they will tell you a, a Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur. It's just an ancient lizard. <laughs> uh, we have Dragon Bait, who goes back to some of the old novels. And we have the, the humanoid type Sauriel now listed. And I enjoyed reading this section because I'm totally all over the Sauriels. Uh, I actually... Long time ago, statted the Sauriels out, made a couple of my own on the website. So if you wanna you wanna go check that out, they're 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 over at nerdarchy.com. This this is actually one of the few pieces of art that I'm not like completely in love with. I don't like this I do not like this version of Dragon Bait. And that's why, because I've seen other versions of Dragon Bait that are like and he's also not wielding his signature sword. Yes. Uh because Dragon Bait had this really odd and weird looking sword. I'm sure if you do a Google image search, you can see what we're talking about. It's it's a pretty, you know, a pretty unique name. So yeah, and you know, so the sword that he actually used to wield was very unwieldy in appearance, but like part of the magic made it work. But again, like you said, we have the serial subtype subtype for humanoids, so that means there's probably going to be more serials at some point. So maybe you know, Xanathar's Guide to Everything or Xanathar's Guide to Everything will have serials. After seeing this. I believe I'm 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 thinking it's less likely to happen because yeah. they talk about you know them being rare and from you know not around and the Sorials don't have their own place, so who knows? Time will tell. We have an absolutely adorable picture of a flying monkey. <laughs> so I would totally just just based off of this alone. One, I want to hug him, and two, <laughs> I will definitely want this guy as. As a familiar. And it completely says that, you know, oh, how, how does it work? With DM's permission, the fine familiar spell can summon a flying monkey. So, uh, you know, there's nothing particularly great about them. They're not particularly magical or anything. So it's got, it's got a fly, a fly speed, a climb speed, and it can, it can walk. It's got pack <laughs> tactics. Ador um, adorableness is probably its power. Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> so after the uh, flying monkey, uh, we have the giant four-armed gargoyle which i was a little disappointed because i read the monsters first and there was no artwork for it so i was <laughs> i was a little a little uh, frustrated but once you actually go into the the meat of the adventure there's a pretty sweet picture there yeah there's an so, awesome uh, like one third page of of just that so a giant <laughs> four-armed gargoyle goodness and it's like for more information on gargoyles see the monster manual uh and after that you're going to wind up getting a handful of repeats from volo's guide so, it's good to have it in here, just, just for those that don't actually have Volos. So, then we get into Jakuli, which is like the, sa the snake serpent monster, 
And I, you know, it, it dates all the way back to AD and D. I believe it first appeared. I want to say in the Fiendom Folio. I feel like I say everything first appeared in the <laughs> Fiendom Folio. Uh, it's not quite horrible enough to really have appeared in that book, but uh, you know, that's another new monster. So it's cool to see like the throwbacks to the to the old stuff. Uh, then we get into this, uh, you know, the weird uh, Kamadan, and you know, this is a a thing that some people say has a resemblance to a displacer beast, but as opposed to having tentacles, it's got a whole bunch of like snake heads and snakes that yeah, come this off one of it. is really weird, and I think that actually appeared first in Monster Manual too, uh, going you know going back to A D and D. So you, know, you you have far better knowledge on on that stuff than than I ever did. Um, you know, I didn't DM as much back then. Yeah, it, yeah. But. This is another weird one. We also, in addition to getting you know the new monsters, the NPCs, we get quite a few um, plant monsters. So we actually have a man trap, which I thought was pretty cool. And when we picked up this book, I bought a a pack of the the pre painted minis, and I got a man trap. So I'm like, ooh, this is it's a pretty cool thing to have. Uh, now I, I think this is probably going to be one of your favorites. I'm really digging it too, and that is the edition of the Terror Folk. Do you mean what the natives call the Terror Folk? Uh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> those guys. Large monstrosity, ten foot tall with a twenty foot twenty foot wingspan. They're humanoid. Use the term loosely, uh, pteranodons, and they literally they do a they do a swoop by. They they come in, they grab people, and whenever they have either is their treasure and there it's food <laughs> and they take they, they take you back to the nest and consume you so you can understand why the people or the natives call them terror folk yeah you, the juggernaut is back from pre, uh, stone juggernaut i should say from previous editions it really has one of only one objective and one goal and that is to run your ass over we get the sioux monster which this the the image of the sioux monster is completely sick it's the art is amazing yeah, and and Again, this is another one of those things that I actually got the mini of. I'm actually pretty impressed with with, with the Sioux Monster mini. You kind of need a bunch of them to use these things properly because they're they're more of a, a pack. They don't they don't just travel with one. So I need a whole bunch of them. Uh, we move into uh, a new or a couple new stats for some tabaxis. You get a hunter. You get a minstrel. Yeah, so which... it gets mixed up pretty much, and you also get like some you get some more Yanti, but they might be reprints from. Oh, I I didn't want to cross you know pa pass by the thorny a quadrupedal fungus that well, the yeah. veggie pygmies ride. <laughs> like I thought that's, that's hysterical. That's another one that, that's from Volo's guide as well. We get some we get some zombies. Oh, we get lots of cool zombies in this one. Well, three. Uh, well, <laughs> right, but what you get, you get a zombie ankylosaurus, which for any of you guys that have been watching for a while, ankylosaurus is not only mine, but his son's favorite dinosaur. You get a zombie gorillion, which, come on, I mean, four-armed ape monstrosity that's undead. Sounds yeah, great. Well, I didn't know I needed this thing until I seen the art on it. And then obviously, guys, I know you guys, if you've been looking at any of the art for a Tomb of Annihilation, you know there's got to be stats for a Tyrannosaurus zombie in here somewhere. See, they, they did they did a one-up on this one because they did not just make an undead T-Rex. They made an undead T-Rex that vomits out smaller zombies yeah well and that's the picture like if you if you're oh, looking I'm, for the picture like <laughs> that is zombies in its mouth i i was aware but i had no idea how they were going to go and go and do it and there's complete stats for vomiting out zombies <laughs> here are not stats but mechanics yeah and other things as well <laughs> and i think that brings us to the last monster which dave is utterly terrified of zorbo so yeah these are also from a previous edition but these things like eat your armor uh, pretty much. So Any, anything that can actually produce a a bonus to your armor class, they they consume it. They become harder to hit, and your your thing suffers a permanent loss. So yeah. So from there we get it. We get into a awesome picture of a, a T Rex vomiting zombies, <laughs> chasing people, and then this is then it's all player handouts, and there is quite a few pages. Of player handouts. Before you go any further, I love the fact that written in this little thing says, 
2017 Wizards of the Coast LLC. Permission is granted to copy and distribute this page for home game use. <laughs> On every single page. <laughs> right, and right there. You also get a huge fold-out map of Cholk in here as well. But you have you have letters, you have floor puzzles, you have uh, riddles, a puzzle key, all kinds of warnings. Uh, there's trickster gods in here, and there's special rules for those, and you actually get handouts for that, which is kind of um, cool. Part of me wants to tear this apart and see how huge this map actually is. Uh, so the, the, there's one last thing I, I do want to bring up that we uh, hadn't really touched on, which is kind of cool. This is probably one, this book is full of diversity as well. So there's a lot of people of color in here. It, it gets mixed up a lot. So that's kind of cool. Kudos to Watts for that. Uh, they did not whitewash, whitewash the jungles of Cholt, that is for sure. Uh, so a lot of amazing art. There's a lot of cool things to put in your game. And it actually seems like it would be a really fun adventure to play through. So let us know what you think of Tome of Annihilation uh, down in the comments below. While you're down there, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, you can check out that link in the description to grab your own copy of Tomb of Annihilation. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy. Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, four nerds by nerds, hanging out with... Nerdarchist Ted. And today we're going to get totally annihilated with the Tomb of Annihilation. Jump down to the description below where you can sign up for Nerdarchy in the newsletter, get weekly gaming tips, as well as learn how to game with Nerdarchy. You'll also find a link to Amazon where you can purchase the Tomb of Annihilation if you so desire. Alright, so clearly if we've got the Tomb of Annihilation in our hands, I guess we're going to... Talk to him of Annihilation. I, I guess. Either that or we're going to beat each other into Annihilation with them. We're both armed. Uh, well, I've got arms, that's for sure. But I, I really would not be interested in trying to either resist being beaten or beat you into, into submission. So it, it took a little work uh, for us to find our local flags that actually had Tomb of Annihilation. Indeed. Like, there was one that's really close to your house, but I think they had carried, like, one copy or something. <laughs> and, of course, it was sold out before either of us got there. Yeah. So then it became a hunt of, you know, who do we call, where do we try to go? And... But we did find one at the comic book store in Glassboro. Absolutely. So kudos, they actually had a nice little stack of them, and along with some of the other stuff, uh, which you may actually see in another video. <laughs> but anyway, so I started looking at it. One of the things is, you know, the... Um, the art on this book is pretty freaking amazing. I've seen this thing where people... Supposed to. The kind of simmering hatred that eats away at their souls until all that remains are dark little spheres of annihilation where the heart used to be. P.S. Don't forget to tear up their character sheets. <laughs> Very important. Uh, so, and then, like, as we move into the book, uh, one of the first things you come across is Dramatis Persona, right? And what that is is basically it is a short description of the NPCs that all appear as well as how to pronounce their name. So I thought that was a cool little ad, because you know what? D&D &D nerds are always fighting over how to pronounce <laughs> shit that's been made up all the time anyway. So they're like, no, look, here it is. So that that's incredibly helpful for, for those that actually care about that kind of stuff. So I, I enjoyed going through some of that stuff, even if some of them were... Um, pretty obvious to me it was good to see like oh well matches up with my line of thinking i'm, I'm glad about this one a couple that i might have questioned it's like oh well here it is then then you know as we delve a little deeper we get into the basically the reason why everyone is on this adventure and on this quest and that is the death curse now we won't go into the details of the death curse because i'm not sure i haven't read the whole thing so i don't know when the players find out about it but i do know like there's a problem they've been sent to solve it Basically is the death curse, right? And you pretty much know that right away, even if you don't know the name of it. But there is some vicious stuff in there. And it also might have some cool things if you just wanted to introduce that by itself into your campaign. And that that in and of itself is a is a worthwhile addition to this. Uh, one of the next things that comes up is character hooks for selected backgrounds. Well, even before you get to that, though, I think... Um... It, it might be worth mentioning the meat grinder mode. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> and in this one, we can actually just tell you what it is, because if you're playing this, I'm pretty sure your DM's going to let you know. If he, <laughs> if he doesn't, he's kind of a jerk, to be so, honest with you. The, the, the real crux of this is, like, okay, you've, been, you've dropped. It's time for death rolls, death saving throws, if you will. 
And instead of having the 10 to pass, it's a 15. That that's what they that's what they say by clicking on the meat grinder switch. Yeah, it make, it's definitely going to make it a little bit tougher. And and uh, so the next thing we have character backgrounds for selected ba uh, character hooks for selected backgrounds. I thought it was pretty awesome that it gives you all of the officially publicized backgrounds from the player's handbook, Skag, and within this book itself, and how to hook those characters right into the story. So the fact that 5th edition requires you to pick a background, you could literally just lay in the O oh, into here, and I guess they bounce some ideas off of them. That's pretty awesome. So Yeah, that is pretty cool that they're kind of going like, you know, a little bit outside of the norm for for talent is to bring in on these projects. And, you know, having that well-known name you know, is cer certainly going to do the project some some extra ju justice or some some extra, uh, you know, spread. If you yeah. Will. And the forward written by Chris Perkins really kind of goes into, like, why they why they got uh, Pendleton the right and, and the ideas behind that. So that's kind of cool. And on the cover, you know, we have Ben Oliver is, is the cover artist, does a great job. Uh, deep within the jungles lies a tomb from which no adventurer returns. So uh, Ben Ol Oliver reveals the tomb's sinis sinister architect who is trapping souls for reasons unknown. Enter at your own peril. Well, actually, you, you kind of learn a little bit as you read through as to what, what it is that he's doing with them, but you know. Well, the DM learns, but the players shouldn't be. <laughs> That's true. So here's, here's the thing, guys. We're going to try and keep this kind of relatively spoiler-free. Uh, there might be some things that slip in, for the, but for the most part, we're not going to be doing spoilers. That's true. So there's the disclaimer, as there always is. And it's one of these little, you know, itty-bitty little things that they add in in there just to add some extra humor. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. And it is itty-bitty, and that's why Ted's reading it, not me. <laughs> so... This adventure will make your players hate you. So you're supposed to do it like this way. Yeah, that's what I did. I did. So you got to hold it up. Yeah. No, no, you got to hold it where it's covering half your face. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There I did go. it wrong. There we go. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to, we're supposed to, supposed right. to like shout or yell or scream. So that yeah. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're pictures. They're, I don't know, they may not be really screaming. Well, you're supposed they, to open your mouth like you're. Yeah, they may not appreciate if we scream. <laughs> Well, anyway, the cover on this is great. It looks good. Nice glossy finish. The same, you know, half matte on the back. So far, so good. We have we have it retails for forty nine ninety five, and if you get it on Amazon, it'll be significantly less. Right. Yeah. Now, I did see some uh, some people pointing out on Facebook that the guy on the DMG is actually Aserac. Uh, yes. So thought that was you know some cool foreshadowing that was done. Yeah, three years into the mix. <laughs> well, you know, you got to plan these things out. You know, one of the first things you get when you open up the Tomb of Annihilation is that awesome green devil face, which is amazing. Which, you know, if you're familiar with Tomb of Horrors, you're familiar with that. Uh, when you open up to the very first interior page um, where it talks about it's got information on the cover. It's got the foreword from Chris Perkins. And, you know, it, it also goes in. They actually brought in a story consultant for this one. It is the writer from Adventure Time, and that is Pendleton Ward. Nice. So they, they wanted to capture some of the humor from that show and, and insert it in.